Thank you very much, dear Connie Voitz, dear Jörg Kessler, dear Lutz Schlange, ladies and gentlemen, and Grüezi miteinander. <laughs> well, the honor is all on my side, uh, but the problem is that the things you are talking about are not at all my turf. I mean, Essentially, I can say no, I'm not competent on all the questions that you are addressing, so I apologize. It will be quite controversial anyway. And let me start, uh, Jörg Kessler, with the first um, challenge. You were mentioning Herbert Spencer. To me, he is not a hero. He has been the inventor of the term and substance of social Darwinism. There is an anecdote of him traveling to the US, coming to Ellis Island and Manhattan, and seeing thousands of immigrants dying because of, he would call it, incompetence, and then he exclaimed to his company, we are the privileged observers of evolution at work. You know, he may have been a good educator, I don't know, and the quotes you gave are quite impressive, no <laughs> doubt. But make sure that the spirit of social Darwinism does not enter your mind. <coughs> well, now, I'm saying on sustainability and food, uh, in food and agriculture, I may be a tiny bit competent. Um, I just had a word uh, with um, Werner Hediger about it, and so these are my two cents on it. Uh, KPNG has published a report the other day about externalities. Externalities were mentioned, of course. And they found out that the food and ag se sector is the worst in terms of creating no end of um, externalities. Meaning, for all the good purposes that food, uh, the food industry is doing for us, there are a lot of damages they also do which all go for uh, unencountered, because we all want to, want to eat. Well, this is not said against agriculture or the food industry, but making those particularly aware of the problems involved. Well, now let's look at the meanings of planetary boundaries and the sustainable development. Actually, the sustainable development uh, goals about which uh, Jonas Hertle has been talking, that's also a problem. I attended one of those conferences in the so-called Open Working Group of the United Nations on the Sustainable Development Goals, and essentially this was all growth, growth, growth. This is what we want in the developing countries, at least. And if I dared to talk about sustainability challenges, they said, no, we want growth, you know? quite aggressive voices from India, Brazil, and others. They want growth. And they call it development. Uh, they call it sustainable. They mean it can go on and on and on, and this is what they call sustainable. They call it sustainable. It is not. Now, we in the North are not uh, in a position to blame them, because we have, uh, have been doing it all along. But that also means that there is a certain danger of sustainable business being um, a contradiction in terms. We don't know yet. Well, I'm going to talk about it. But let me first uh, talk about the planetary boundaries. The hero of that term is Johann Rockström, 
founder and director of the Stockholm Resilience Center. He had been the director of the Stockholm Environment Institute until he realized that the real challenge in our days is planetary boundaries. And in nature, together with another team, uh, he uh, wrote an article on the safe operating space. And the most famous picture from that is here, showing that in terms of biodiversity, in, f in terms of phosphates, and increasingly in the terms of climate, we are leaving the safe operating space, which is the green uh, core of the picture. So, we are no longer working in the safe operating space. And that means we are breaking, we are crushing the planetary boundaries. Uh, he, together with my friend Anders Wigmann, who is the other co-president of Clover Home, have uh, written a book, Bankrupting Nature, in which uh, they show in a embarrassing similarities between irresponsible behavior of bankers, it was a few years after 2008, and those who destroy nature. It's the same mentality, thinking short term, destroying and calling it a profit. You know, a forester just cutting wood and selling it looks as if he was a good businessman because his quarterly reports will be good, but it, he has destroyed his forest. You know, this is the destructive kind of a certain part of the business community. Actually, there are exceptions. Um, four, four years ago or so, Unilever had a new CEO, Paul Polman who, as first thing, said, I am no longer publishing quarterly reports. And you can imagine the anger, the aggression against him in the shareholders community, saying, what an arrogant guy, not allowing us quarterly insights uh, into his business. And he said, no. And then many of them left the uh, shares of, uh, sold their shares of Unilever to demonstrate him the power of money. Then he said, oh, I'm very happy them leaving uh, as shareholders. I don't want them as shareholders. And a few months later, I mean, of course, this led to a collapse of the uh, stock value of the, the Unilever. <coughs> uh, but, but a few months later, Stocks had risen because he uh, ignored the quarterly reports and said, no, we want to do long-term business. In the meantime, I believe the total shareholder value of uh, Unilever is twice uh, it, uh, of what it was before he, c he took office. So, long-term thinking is possible, not under all circumstances, and at the end of my talk, I'll be talking about the frame conditions that could make it a lot more profitable to be sustainable. Today, it is not automatically. Okay. Now, everybody is talking about the uh, sustainable development triangle. You all know that, I'm sure. I'm sure you're also teaching it. I want to crush that as well. Because, isn't the economy part of society? And isn't society part of nature? And now tell me how you can construct a triangle between the whole, a subset of the whole, and a subset of the subset of the whole. Geometrically, this is not possible. In other words, the triangle para paradigm is an anthropocentric tomfoolery. <laughs> Its purpose was to legitimize <coughs> the anthropocentric business as usual practices and have a little greenwashing, you know. So, be careful when using the triangle. I mean, there are legitimate places where you can use it and not uh, smashing it all together. But I warn you not to forget the environmental part, which is so seductive. So to me, more convincing is the 
sustainability rectangle which is left after you look at small ecological footprints and a high human development index which is a three component index established by the United Nations uh, composed of economic well-being um, education indeed and health so if that is high the HEI and the uh, footprints are small then you are sustainable now how many countries are sustainable Cuba is left now is that the most attractive country perhaps not and they are only inside the um, rectangle at the time of this picture um, because they manage with very poor economic uh, situation to maintain a reasonably intact education and health system otherwise they would be out as well so in other words the rich countries have too large footprints and the poor countries are too poor that's a simple fact so sustainability, sustainable development is a dream, it's not a reality. And if 7 billion people had footprints like today's US Americans, we would need five planets Earth. No optimized triangle of the US business companies can make the American way of life sustainable. You know? But they have many mouthfuls of uh, narratives about their being sustainable sustainable mining etc you know they keep talking about that but a five-fold increase of resource productivity could repopulate the sustainability rectangle the rich countries could walk down uh, reducing their footprints without jeopardizing their uh, HDI and the poor countries could move up um, becoming really wealthy without increasing their footprints <coughs> so it might be one potential solution and then it would allow us to make do with one earth with the one earth we have another way of expressing the same truth is called decoupling with my other hat as uh, co-chair of the International Resource Panel, um, I'm kind of concentrating on the agenda of decoupling. But the first decoupling report uh, we produced said decoupling isn't happening. Here you see the almost perfect correlation between GDP per capita and um, no, no, upwards is the resource intensity and uh, to the right is the GDP per capita. So it's essentially one line. In other words, decoupling is not happening. If you want to get richer, you better have more turnover. More or less the same applies to CO2 emissions. It's also one <coughs> flat line. For pollution control, decoupling has been well established, for instance, in Switzerland. I was uh, visiting often the canton of Zurich and the Zurichsee, so it was badly polluted in the 1960s. And now it's clean. So from the transition period of rich and dirty, Switzerland became rich and clean, which is fabulous. Of course, everybody is aiming for it. The question is, can it be copied? Is Switzerland altogether sustainable in terms of material turnover? Imagine what Glencore is doing. Um, can it, uh, has it not perhaps exported the problem? And many such questions will arise. But if limited uh, resources are a problem, or CO2 emissions for that matter, we should create a new Kuznets curve, this one, on dematerialization and the other one on decarbonization question is if this is working but if we manage to show it's possible then developing countries could be induced to tunnel through 
Unless they do, we don't have a chance. So we created then a new decoupling report, which goes a little deeper into the uh, painful questions. And for that, we distinguish between decoupling by maturation. You should, should not be overly proud of that. I mean, the Chinese are bragging with um, having less carbon dioxide emissions and less material turnover with, uh, per GDP. But if the G GDP grows by 8% per year and the material turnover only by 7% per, per year, it is still a lot of additional turnover that they are causing. And then there is decoupling by trade. This is what Germany or Switzerland or J Japan have been doing all the time. Simply export the dirty and clumsy things outside and then uh, concentrate on the clean ones. But then there is a third possibility, decoupling by intentional increase of resource productivity. And this is essentially the undone, certainly unfinished agenda. And that could lead to absolute decoupling. The other one is only relative decoupling. And that means that ambitious efficiency increases mean nothing less than a green Kondratiev cycle after the five brown cycles we had. And this is mostly a task for engineers and perhaps politicians. Some of you may have seen a book by the Swiss-born Detroit guru, Bob Lutz, writing a book, Car Guys versus Bean Counters. Meaning essentially engineers against masters of business administration. And he says he has looked at the steep rise over the last 30 years of Masters of Business Administration and at the same time the steady loss of quality of American industry. And then he says there must be a causal chain between the two. So perhaps you better listen to Switzerland or Japan or Germany or the places where the engineers are still running the show. And he recommends America to lay off uh, thousands of MBAs and let the engineers come in. Well, that's too extreme. And anyway, the success story of Switzerland or China for that matter is that um, engineers and masters of business administration uh, cooperate and this is what you have to do <coughs> and you do it in good management schools anyway okay well and uh, a five-fold increase in resource productivity is what uh, my Australian friends Charlie Hargroves et al uh, and I are advertising in factor five in which essentially we are demonstrating in the four most important sectors that the five-fold increase of resource productivity is available now. I mean, it may take 30 or 40 years to uh, become mainstream, but te technology is not the obstacle. It's proven. We looked into industry, including heavy industry, including cement and steel. We looked into the transport sector, we looked into the buildings sector, and into agriculture. And everywhere we care to look, we find the opportunities for a fivefold increase of resource productivity. But why is it not happening? Because it's not particularly profitable under today's conditions. And some synergies exist also between energy efficiency and material efficiency, meaning recycling. For instance, with aluminium, everybody knows that. But in many cases, it is trade-offs. It's not uh, synergies. At the International Resource Panel, we looked into the 
uh, recycling rates of metals. And under the leadership of Tom Gradle, we found out that, well, actually it was published in 2010, um, that most high-tech metals coming in milligrams, not in tons, the re typical worldwide recycling rates are below 1%. So, of a kilogram of indium, a hugely valuable metal, only 10 grams or so are being recycled. Why? Because it's not profitable to recycle. It's all very simple. But then, uh, as co-chair of the panel, I asked for a new team of researchers to produce a new report on, oh no, I'm sorry, on recycling opportunities, technologies, infrastructures. And they did it. It was published last year. Uh, the coordinator was Marcus Reuter from Autotech in Finland. And they found out that for the small metals, the brown ones here, the strategy is not recycling. It's too late if it comes to the real end of life. You better start with the design. And in particular, this is the next step at our panel, into the design of remanufacturing as an alternative to recycling, a substitute kind of, meaning that whole components <coughs> containing those valuable uh, materials will remain intact at the end of life of the product and then can be reassembled, being components, into new holes of products. The automotive industry is actually quite keen uh, for um, remanufacturing. And we now kind of hijacked uh, one of the best experts of the world, Nabil Nazar, um, an Egyptian-born American at Rochester Institute of Technology, to join our panel. Next week in Rotterdam, we are going to see him again. And the German government, uh, after our last conference of the panel, which was in Chile, um, was so excited that they organized a remanufacturing conference in Berlin with Nabil Nazar. And lots of German big industries attended not because of the panel, of which they never had heard, but because of Nabil Nazar. And so now this is becoming a new uh, kind of enlightened uh, activity of our panel, remanufacturing. In East Asia, it's well known. In America, at least the term is known. The practice is, is poor. But maybe this is something for the European industries to really embrace and let the design schools that are often uh, in good partnership with the business schools uh, particularly focus on the challenge of remanufacturing. Okay, now, so much for the propaganda for high efficiency. I'm not going uh, through uh, too many details now, but I want to address another problem. It's the rebound effect. You all have heard of it, that most efficiency increases have been gobbled up by additional consumption. This is a 300 years history of rebound in lighting. Lighting became more efficient by six orders of magnitude, a million times more efficient over 300 years. And what, what was the result? A million times more light. Um, two weeks ago or so, 
three Japanese guys uh, got the physics Nobel Prize for inventing the LED. One of them is actually my friend, uh, Shushi Nakamura. He was next door to me when I was a dean of the um, School of Environmental Science and Management at the University of California in Santa Barbara. And uh, I often had uh, talks with him. Great guys. The LED is roughly 10 times better in terms of producing lighting from, uh, from watt second uh, kilowatt hour. And uh, then a publication uh, came out a year or two ago by Saunders and Sau uh, asking the question, will the LED reduce power demand? Answer, no, there will be more light. <laughs> of course. This is the human nature. More, more, more. You know? But what do we do about the rebound effect? We have to address that. Well, there are many, many side benefits of energy efficiency, no doubt. I'm not going into details. It's from the International Energy Agency also making propaganda for it. But, again, this does say very little about the rebound effect. Well, to sum up this very brief story about efficiency, potentials are absolutely huge. There are lots of positive side effects too, but much of it remains sleeping and much is eaten up by the rebound effect. In short, I mean, this is caricature. A new term has uh, emerged in the international debate. It's the circular economy. The EU have organized a big conference in June this year and uh, at the Club of Rome we have been discussing it. We uh, attracted to the Club of Rome Ellen MacArthur, once uh, world champion in one hand sailing around the world, uh, then very, very famous in the UK, and she is now a dame, dame Ellen MacArthur. Um, and, uh, after stopping competitive sailing, she founded the Ellen MacArthur Foundation essentially on the circular economy. She's sitting on the Isle of Wight and uh, we are cooperating with her quite closely. The question is, however, how much can you really recycle? It's not always easy. I demonstrated it with, the, with some of the metals. In reality, we are quite far away from circular. In Britain, they calculated it that 80%, 81% of the economy is still completely linear. And then 19% circular, and the blue little thing is actually uh, not very circular. It's landfills uh, and other disposal forms. I wouldn't call that um, circular. So something like 9% may be left for circular economy. So we are at the very, very early beginning. A major step forward and out of those tragedies of non-recycling could be changing the business models. From selling goods to leasing, sharing, repairing. Some of you may know Walter Stahel, he's a Swiss, with his performance economy. Also, we also made him a new member of the Club of Rome. And essentially he says, if it is in the interest of the manufacturer that things live long because he is earning from the leasing uh, fees, then you will have a totally different generation of products. If they always sell it, you have the inbuilt obsolescence phenomenon. Now, there are some policy questions. Of course, uh, we have several options. Industry always wants all voluntary. That's the paradise for corporate social responsibility. Um, telling everybody, we are doing it anyway. We are good guys anyway, aren't we? Um, then there is the com command and control um, option, including bans. That was the main agenda for the pollution control questions because it was toxic 
and then you have to limit toxicity. And then um, tradable permits, which has worked for some air pollutants. In Australia, they uh, do it on water extraction. It can be done on land use, more difficult there. It has not worked very well on CO2 in the EU. The ETS is kind of a nightmare, isn't it? Including in particular all those loopholes that they created. And then direct pricing, which everybody hates in the political arena that is, and in the business community. But in reality, I mean, we, we know that since 20 years, don't we? Um, it's the underestimated and, I'm afraid, sleeping giant. I shall be advertising it again. My preference relating to resource efficiency is direct <coughs> pricing. Of course we must avoid capital destruction or industry emigration and social injustice. But these can be dealt with. So, when it was at the China Council, chairman, co-chair of a working group on economic instruments for energy efficiency and the environment. I persuaded the Chinese folks in the group, 50%, that it could be beneficial for China to let energy and primary resource prices rise, actively rise, but slowly, in proportion to the document average efficiency increases. Meaning that what you pay on a monthly basis for your energy or material services will not rise, on average that is. But the slow ones will be penalized and the fast ones will be honored. And this is the business condition all around the world for all production factors. It's some kind of a ping pong. Rise resource productivity, resource prices will rise. And if resource prices, including energy prices, are rising, you will see a lot more um, interest and um, economic um, obligation to increase resource productivity. And the sky is the limit. I mean, uh, typically in my talks, I'm uh, asking the following question. How many kilowatt hours would you need to lift a 10 kilograms weight from sea level to the top of Mount Everest? And I was asking my students in California, the typical answer was anything like a thousand kilowatt hours, which sounds like a, a good gut feeling. When I'm asking the question in, in Switzerland, they are closer to the Alps, they know that. Um, the, the typical answer is a little lower. But the real answer by the teacher of physics is one quarter of a kilowatt hour, which is unbelievable. Imagine what a huge powerhouse a kilowatt hour is. Lifting that bucket of water four times to the top of Mount Everest. That's one kilowatt hour. Isn't that unbelievable? I mean, I'm showing this only to demonstrate to you that all the uh, published estimates of energy demand are profoundly wrong by something like a factor of 100 or so. You know? Everybody is believing that energy demand is a law of nature, you can't do anything about it. It's completely wrong in terms of physics. So please correct your minds in this regard. And actually for materials, it's even easier, because materials tend to be stable. You, they can be recycled no end. Of course, the energy demand for um, separation is high. Okay. So, this ping-pong, the logic of it, has been proven to be successful in the Industrial Revolution. Over 150 years, 
we have seen that ping-pong between labor productivity and labor costs or wages. Rise labor productivity, the workers can demand higher wages and they are successful. And when they are successful, uh, you need to improve labor productivity. And it, it rose 20-fold, roughly, in 150 years. And it's still rising. And as I've indicated in terms of electricity and materials, a 20-fold increase of resource productivity is always possible. So, it will, be, it will happen only if it is profitable. Possible is not good enough, it has to be profitable. Okay, that's the idea. And the newest, new resource ping pong could cause a steady increase, perhaps fivefold, of average resource productivity in 40 years. And it would reduce wanton wealth, wastefulness and much of the rebound effect because it be would become costly to just increase lighting or whatever. Then we need two corrections. One, to take care of the social problem. They did that in South Africa. After apartheid, they um, dramatically increased prices for water and energy, but allowed for a lifeline tariff for the poor. And then, for industry, it's more, a uh, trifle more sophisticated. You could also do, as they do in Germany, in the context of the um, Renewable Energies Law, uh, a low price energy for industry. But that's not very good, because essentially it's an invitation to laziness. But what you can do is what the Swedes did with their... Um, nitrous oxides tax in the early 1990s in the context of acid rain. They announced an NOx tax 40 times as high as the then existing NOx tax in France. And of course all of the Swedish industry went up in alarm and said we are going to leave the country if you do that. And then the government said no, 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 please stay here. Um, what we will do is return the money to you, but not on a per ton of uh, NOx basis, that would be crazy, but per added value or per full job. So the um, electricity producers and the steel industry and the non-ferrous metals and the chemical industry they all got their money back for their respective branches and they didn't, leave, didn't lose a Swedish crown. And nobody left the country, but inside the branch they had a fierce competition who is the first of getting rid of the NOx. And this is what I imagine for energy. energy. A slow trajectory and full um, revenue neutrality for the branch and nobody has any reason to leave unless he is very stupid okay so where are the winners and where are the losers well high-tech industry crafts all of Switzerland is on the winning side perhaps with the exception of Glencore um, the losers freight transport perhaps aircrafts energy intensive industry unless they are protected or they are learning. I mean, the cement and steel industry, we have been demonstrating they can. And long-distance long commuting, the kind of American way of life. Clearly, I'm not expecting the paradigm shift to happen very soon. But if pioneering countries, such as Switzerland, Germany, Japan, China, enjoy first mover advantages, the others will have no choice but following. And if responsible management education includes such visions and policies, we may end up having better managers. Thank you.